Welcome to Switzerland. Did you know that our country is not just a great place to visit, but also your first class business location? We are centrally located in Europe and we have the world's best infrastructure. Oh, and the train is always on time, so let's take a journey. Did you know that Switzerland has four official languages? Yeah? No? Forse? Decidia? Don't worry, we also have excellent English skills. However, we don't spend all day chatting, we love to work. In 2012, we could have voted for longer holidays and we voted against them. It's crazy, isn't it? But we're not crazy. Our economy and government are among the world's most stable. That, combined with our outstanding talent pool and a deregulated labor market, makes Switzerland the most innovative and competitive nation in the world. Our Swiss dual education system provides an excellent mix of both vocational education and apprenticeships. Now let's take a look at industry. Maybe Germany, the United States and China are well known for their industrial output. But did you know that Swiss industrial production per capita beats all of them? Sorry guys. Our country is small, but hey, three Swiss companies are among the global top 20 most valuable companies. Furthermore, we offer the best quality of life. That's why three Swiss cities are among the world's best for the highest quality of living. In addition, Switzerland is one of the happiest nations on the globe. Perhaps because we eat on average 12 kilograms of chocolate per year? Switzerland is the best location for innovation, has stable political, economic and financial conditions, has the highest living standard and welcomes your business. So tell us now, when will you invest in Switzerland? Switzerland Global Enterprise, enabling new business. Find out more at s-ge.com.
For us in the Aditya Birla Group, Odisha has been one of our most preferred investment destinations. Chief Minister Sri Naveen Patnaik's exceptional leadership has been the singular factor in the rapid progress of Odisha. The state government has leveraged its competitive advantages, including its progressive policies and governance framework are a big pull factor. Come join the juggernaut.
In healthcare, a vast ecosystem is helping therapy innovators become more patient-centric and more effective than ever before. Cytiva supports researchers, biopharma, and clinicians in the pursuit of more targeted treatments. In discovery, speed and accuracy are everything. The faster and smarter researchers can work, the more patients benefit. To ensure that new, more targeted therapies become reality, we're equipping biomanufacturers with the tools and expertise they need to produce cost-effectively and quickly. How can tens of thousands of individualized patient doses be manufactured quickly, efficiently, and securely? The answer, with a healthy dose of expertise and innovation. We're creating processes and solutions that are scalable and address complex needs. We work to deliver diagnostic tools and other technologies to bring the right therapy to the right patient at the right time so that life-saving medicines come within the reach of more people and could save more lives. Cell culture, protein purification, biomarker imaging and analysis. It may not be what most think about when envisioning the future of healthcare, but this is what we do. Our part in changing the world. Advancing and accelerating. Discovery, manufacturing, diagnostics, future therapeutics.
to regulatory compliance is long and filled with choices. With a combination of standards, process, and service, USP can help guide your path to compliant, quality products. Trust the standard that sets the benchmark for medicines. Our robust and collaborative scientific process is part of our comprehensive approach. We offer reference standards that are tied to USP monographs to help you minimize risk and enhance your confidence in compliance, reduce time and resources spent developing in-house standards, and streamline your path to regulatory compliance. We work with independent volunteer scientific experts who rigorously review and approve our standards, which undergo testing by USP and other laboratories around the world. Ongoing testing of our standards helps ensure the quality of your product over time, and only USP reference standards are linked to official USP NF monographs that provide specifications for the identity, purity, and potency to meet FDA requirements without further in-house qualification and the needs of our global customers. With USP, you have access to our in-house scientific experts to guide you every step of the way. In addition to our best-in-class USP reference standards, we offer training, education, and other services. Our online resources help smooth your path to regulatory compliance. Our standards provide precise testing and validation guidelines, as well as reference samples for testing. Drugs can be made consistently every time. We are more than reference standards. We provide a unique combination of standards, process, and service. From buying to applying standards, we support your bottom line with reference standards that have been rated best in class by our customers. Talk with us to find out how we can help you navigate your journey to regulatory compliance. Contact USP at USP.org. Welcome to Switzerland. Did you know that our country is not just a great place to visit, but also your first-class business location? We are centrally located in Europe, and we have the world's best infrastructure. Oh, and the train is always on time, so let's take a journey. Did you know that Switzerland has four official languages? Ja? No? Forse? Bete dia? Don't worry, we also have excellent English skills. However, we don't spend all day chatting. We love to work. In 2012, we could have voted for longer holidays, and we voted against them. It's crazy, isn't it? But we're not crazy. Our economy and government are among the world's most stable. That, combined with our outstanding talent pool and a deregulated labor market, makes Switzerland the most innovative and competitive nation in the world. Our Swiss dual education system provides an excellent mix of both vocational education and apprenticeships. Now let's take a look at industry. Maybe Germany, the United States, and China are well known for their industrial output. But did you know that Swiss industrial production per capita beats all of them? Sorry, guys. Our country is small, but hey, three Swiss companies are among the global top 20 most valuable companies. Furthermore, we offer the best quality of life. That's why three Swiss cities are among the world's best for the highest quality of living. In addition, Switzerland is one of the happiest nations on the globe. Perhaps because we eat on average 12 kilograms of chocolate per year? 
Switzerland is the best location for innovation, has stable political, economic and financial conditions, has the highest living standard and welcomes your business. So tell us now, when will you invest in Switzerland? Switzerland Global Enterprise, enabling new business. Find out more at s-ge.com.
For us in the Aditya Birla group, Odisha has been one of our most preferred investment destinations. Chief Minister Shri Naveen Patnaik's exceptional leadership has been the singular factor in the rapid progress of Odisha. The state government has leveraged its competitive advantages, including its progressive policies and governance framework are a big pull factor. Join the juggernaut. In healthcare, a vast ecosystem is helping therapy innovators become more patient-centric and more effective than ever before. Cytiva supports researchers, biopharma, and clinicians in the pursuit of more targeted treatments. 
In discovery, speed and accuracy are everything. The faster and smarter researchers can work, the more patients benefit. To ensure that new, more targeted therapies become reality, we're equipping biomanufacturers with the tools and expertise they need to produce cost-effectively and quickly. How can tens of thousands of individualized patient doses be manufactured quickly, efficiently, and securely? The answer, with a healthy dose of expertise and innovation. We're creating processes and solutions that are scalable and address complex needs. We work to deliver diagnostic tools and other technologies to bring the right therapy to the right patient at the right time so that life-saving medicines come within the reach of more people and could save more lives. Cell culture, protein purification, biomarker imaging and analysis. It may not be what most think about when envisioning the future of healthcare, but this is what we do. Our part in changing the world. Advancing and accelerating. Discovery, manufacturing, diagnostics, future therapeutics. to regulatory compliance is long and filled with choices. With a combination of standards, process, and service, USP can help guide your path to compliant, quality products. 
Trust the standard that sets the benchmark for medicines. Our robust and collaborative scientific process is part of our comprehensive approach. We offer reference standards that are tied to USP monographs to help you minimize risk and enhance your confidence and compliance, reduce time and resources spent developing in-house standards, and streamline your path to regulatory compliance. We work with independent volunteer scientific experts who rigorously review and approve our standards, which undergo testing by USP and other laboratories around the world. Ongoing testing of our standards helps ensure the quality of your product over time, and only USP reference standards are linked to official USP NF monographs that provide specifications for the identity, purity, and potency to meet FDA requirements without further in-house qualification and the need of our global customers. With USP, you have access to our in-house scientific experts to guide you every step of the way. In addition to our best-in-class USP reference standards, we offer training, education, and other services. Our online resources help smooth your path to regulatory compliance. Our standards provide precise testing and validation guidelines, as well as reference samples for testing. Drugs can be made consistently every time. We are more than reference standards. We provide a unique combination of standards, process, and service. From buying to applying standards, we support your bottom line with reference standards that have been rated best in class by our customers. Talk with us to find out how we can help you navigate your journey to regulatory compliance. Contact USP at USP.org. Welcome to Switzerland. Did you know that our country is not just a great place to visit, but also your first-class business location? We are centrally located in Europe, and we have the world's best infrastructure. Oh, and the train is always on time, so let's take a journey. Did you know that Switzerland has four official languages? Ja? No? Forse? Veci dia? Don't worry, we also have excellent English skills. However, we don't spend all day chatting. We love to work. In 2012, we could have voted for longer holidays, and we voted against them. It's crazy, isn't it? But we're not crazy. Our economy and government are among the world's most stable. That, combined with our outstanding talent pool and a deregulated labor market, makes Switzerland the most innovative and competitive nation in the world. Our Swiss dual education system provides an excellent mix of both vocational education and apprenticeships. Now let's take a look at industry. Maybe Germany, the United States, and China are well known for their industrial output. But did you know that Swiss industrial production per capita beats all of them? Sorry, guys. Our country is small. But hey, three Swiss companies are among the global top 20 most valuable companies. Furthermore, we offer the best quality of life. That's why three Swiss cities are among the world's best for the highest quality of living. In addition, Switzerland is one of the happiest nations on the globe. Perhaps because we eat on average 12 kilograms of chocolate per year? Switzerland is the best location for innovation, has stable political, economic, and financial conditions, has the highest living standard, and welcomes your business. 
So tell us now, when will you invest in Switzerland? Switzerland Global Enterprise, enabling new business. Find out more at s-ge.com.
yes yes good afternoon everyone and a very warm welcome for this session uh, in a minute we'll start the session and we are all going on uh, live mode now please thank you Miss Rashmika, please let me know when we start. When do we start? Sure, sir. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, can you please uh, confirm? Uh, we have joined to the main platform, right? I would request the IT team to please let us know. Yes, please. We have. Great. Yes, we can begin now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this week has been more like a medtech week. We have had so many marvelous sessions across several panels, blessed by uh, policymakers and industry leaders. Uh, this is yet another marvelous panel with uh, luminaries both from the government as well as the industry. We have our most respected secretary, Department of Pharmaceuticals, Madam Miss Aparna. Uh, we have Dr. Miraj Singh from the National Biopharma Mission. And we have our six vibrant industry leaders. Uh, some of you we have met, and most of you we have met earlier in some context or other. Uh, in five minutes, I have been asked to summarize the goal of this panel. And uh, then we will be blessed to hear uh, Madam Secretary, Department of Pharmaceuticals, post which we will have the panel members. Mm, but before the panel members, we have an introductory remark also by the representative of National Biopharma Mission, Dr. Miraj Singh. I just want to share two points with this August panel that in hospital administration, when we were trained at AIMS, we were taught the input cycle of healthcare. Input cycle of healthcare is like a pie with four parts. Part one, and we were clearly told where we can make a difference and where we cannot individually. The first pie of the cycle of healthcare value chain, what makes a hospital is land and the buildings and the infrastructure the pipelines and the power. This sector of land building infrastructure power is technically never going to be within the hands of health products. It's never going to be, hand of, uh, be in the hand of healthcare itself because it comes in infrastructure sector, real estate sector and so on. The second pie of healthcare are the human resources. Now, while we may go into automation and that may impact the total number of jobs and new industries may add to total number of jobs. The salaries are never going to go down. All of us would like that our human resources, human capital is paid uh, at, at, at the best we can. And therefore, technically, even this pie, the second pie of healthcare also is never going to be under control cost wise. The third pie is pharmaceutical products. India, for its legacy of last three decades, has been a champion of pharma and a global pharma hub. It is the pharmacy of the world. And therefore, to a great extent, we should be proud of our ethos and professionalism that this sector has shown. While there might be some gaps, which the government is also trying to actively bridge, particularly in terms of key starting materials and API, this is a mat this is a third pie of pharma is greatly in our control in terms of economic activity and economic security. We are not overtly dependent. And the fourth pie of healthcare that runs our hospital is medical technology. And it is the weakest pie of our healthcare circle. 
partly because it was tech technologically complex as uh, secretary uh, uh, madam secretary also keeps reminding us the sheer diversification and heterogeneity of medical devices medical technology but also because it was only in 2014 and practically in 2015 that medical technology even got a department within government of india this was an orphan sector it didn't have an owner and we clearly see the difference the ownership makes day after day month after month quarter after quarter just to give you a summary the medical technology sector is growing at the rate of 15% but that's not the news the news is for the first time in the history of independent india between 1819 when the import on medical technology was 43366 crore in 1920 financial year the import of medical technology was 41600 crore for the first time in the history of independent india actually import was negative and we actually registered a minus 4.1% in medical technology import whereas the medical technology sector itself is growing at 15% so just imagine a value a segment which is growing at 15% and the import actually came down by 4.1% that's marvelous and i think together we need to acknowledge is this achievement it is no small achievement if it would have been petroleum if it would have been natural gas it would have been many other sectors this would have caught the eyes of many but given that the sector itself is very small it's just 53000 crore this is not substantial but the value proposition cannot be underestimated so in a in in the most congratulatory manner i would like to thank the policy makers the department of pharmaceuticals the department of biotechnology the industry leaders all healthcare uh, champions that are present on this panel to take a moment to celebrate what has become a progressive journey for indian medtech because we are on the progress path now we can confidently say with this with this opening uh, remark uh, i have the honor of welcoming uh, madam secretary ms aparna department of pharmaceuticals uh, in a very short time uh, we all have experienced in our own way what her leadership can do in a very short time we have seen uh, how policy instruments uh, right from ppo to pli their implementation how a department a parent department can drive industrial growth and scientific uh, outreach uh, we have seen it and therefore it is our pleasure to have you on this panel madam uh, we also have a brilliant set of panelists all of you uh, uh, all of whom you know very well uh, we have dr miraj singh uh, but with your opening remarks as a plenary talk uh, we will begin this panel and we will request you to share the journey that you have in your mind for this sector given that you have seen how cluttered we were how organized we could become and the potential we carry uh, you keep asking us what is our vision what is our requirement what is our need we will take this moment today just to make it very special to know your vision and your dream for this medtech sector and the role you think it can play in providing for affordable healthcare to india and to the global markets over to you madam you are on mute thank you thank you dr jitendra sharma thank you for your uh, opening remarks uh, for your welcome uh, a very warm welcome to all my uh, co panelists here Uh, members from the industry as well as from the uh, biopharma mission uh, and all the um, all our uh, participants who have joined in on this uh, on this uh, session uh, i would like to say that uh, as has been pointed out i do believe that the medtech sector or the medical devices sector is a relatively less attended sector within the overall healthcare sector however i think we are making amends at uh, more than uh, you know uh, adequate pace in the sense that we are 
devoting a lot of attention to, to medical devices over the last couple of years. Uh, as all of you probably appreciate, the healthcare sector as a whole globally is at, a, at an inflection point. This is a moment in time where it is up to us who are in the sector to make or break it. Rise up to the expectations and the latent demand and the potential that is there to do some good work or fail to do so. So therefore, not only is there a sense of uh, urgency, I think there is also a sense of inevitability about that this is a moment where we need to, uh, to act and act in a wise way based on our experience with a better appreciation of the potential that lies in this sector. Awareness of the importance of healthcare, not just for individuals, but for communities and across the globe is at an all-time high. Awareness that healthcare is not an isolated sector is also at an all-time high. With the COVID-19 pandemic, people understood that there is a trifecta of the economic, the natural and the human systems. And it was at that trifecta that the, uh, the pandemic arose because of you know, globalization, encroachment into the space of uh, nature, etc., etc. Attention is also at an all-time high. I think uh, uh, more attention from the highest uh, echelons of the power structure, whether at the global level or at the national level or at uh, local government levels, is very apparent. This is a time, I think, that we have also seen unprecedented levels of collaboration, innovation and resource mobilization. If you just take a second to think about these three, three, three aspects, collaboration across sectors, between public and private, we saw a lot of it not only in India but in many countries. Innovation, India was a prime example of uh, frugal innovation. The vaccine development and the process that uh, powered the vaccine development is uh, an example of innovation. Pharma products, medical devices, instrumentation, all have seen innovation in the last year or so. And resource mobilization. For the first time, I think huge resources are being devoted by supranationals, by multinational organizations, apart from countries, towards healthcare sector. And therefore, I do believe that this is, uh, as I said, an inflection point to make or break. What can we, as the medical devices sector, bring to this? Of course, we have Mr. Miraj Singh here. He will speak from the biopharma point of view also. But I would like to focus on the what we can or we should be doing in our country. This morning, we had another session. So for me, and seeing that a, a couple of faces are common, I would like to have a continuum here. I think we need to look at this and how we manage the demand for medical devices, the demand for pharma products or medical products, and the supply that we are able to bring to this. I think we need to raise the equilibrium from the current level to a higher order, where we are both able to produce a larger, wider range of products that meets patient demand, and we are also able to manage the ability to absorb the wider, larger range of products that will be available. On the supply side, as far as government is concerned, we have now started focusing attention on providing support for infrastructure. So whether it is um, medical clusters or medical device parks that will soon be coming up, or even incorporating the requirements of the healthcare sector in the national logistics policy, which probably two years ago we would not have thought of ensuring that cold chain storage for vaccines is a part of our national logistics policy. But today, everybody would be foolish not to do so. So at every level of infrastructure, I believe we are paying attention. We are paying attention of improving competitiveness by providing incentives that will encourage investment in the sector, encourage growth at scale. As you know, the FDI policy was already relaxed. EODB, we are very much ahead of the curve. We have improved incredibly over the last four to five years. And this is a time where, as India, we are also looking to be a part of the demand for diversification of the global value chain. I have here in the panel with me members 
who are large exporters from out of India. And we do believe that the potential for more such excellent entrepreneurs is there. That space is there and we need to take advantage of this global demand for diversification of the supply chain. On the other hand, on the demand side, we have the world's arguably largest health insurance scheme in India with the Jan Arogya Yojana, which provides for insurance cover with, again, unprecedented levels of flexibility and customer centricity for, I think, about 500 million individuals, over 100 million families. You have an increased outlay, not only at the central government level, but also by state governments towards healthcare. We have 150,000 wellness centers coming up, being transformed from a traditional public health provider to somebody who is more uh, intersectoral, let us say, that kind of sectors are coming up. You have policy decisions on public procurement, which should uh, be able to give better articulation of the demand across the country. And finally, I would say specifically for the medical devices sector, there is a possibility that we will be looking at non-traditional ways of providing public services through private sector participation when it comes to high-end diagnostics like imaging and scans. At the junction of this supply and the demand is governance. Is this box of governance, regulatory systems, taking care of quality of products, taking care of certification of products, taking care of testing capacities, pricing uh, regulations. This is that junction where government is most active. And I would appreciate today how you look at, to know from our panelists, how you look at the manner in which this bridge between supply and demand in the form of sector governance can be made very efficient, very transparent, and very responsible. At the end, I will just say that while we talk about issues that are important to healthcare service providers and to the suppliers of medical products, I do believe we should never forget that in India, for us, access, availability, and affordability of healthcare and medical products will continue to be most important when we take policy decisions. How we are able to reconcile these, uh, these goals is what I would leave for the panel to discuss. This, as Jitendra Ji said, is the way I look at the sector as a whole. I believe if the sector is to reach its full potential, the talent that is in the sector is to be met, the needs of our patient population is to be met, we have to work together, not only on what is to be done, but more importantly, how it can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you for putting economic science and governance together as always i think uh, uh, sandwiching governance uh, as the flavor and strength between the bread of economics and science leading to complete service delivery uh, is is the key message we always get from you um, it is very reassuring always uh, i also want to share with you uh, that uh, the scientific and industrial services that are today scattered in the country, perhaps we don't even know who can provide what to our innovators and entrepreneurs. Because our innovators and entrepreneurs require services of validation, testing, prototyping, most importantly, uh, machining, molding, validation, and batch production. We have no idea where these, these services are. Uh, at 4 o'clock today, Honorable Minister for Science and Technology, who is also the Honorable Minister for Health, would be launching an e-marketplace called Tecola, architected by Kalam Institute of Health Technology, which is like a platform, very much like Uber or Swiggy, where large number of labs, government labs, private labs, public labs, commercial labs, can actually register themselves for free, displaying their menu of services and costs and innovators can access that information for free on that app and can also place orders for their services uh, depending upon which laboratories and scientific services are available in their geographic location. So this is an e-marketplace which will be launched in another 40, 50 minutes, which would also be a huge bridge between science and industry. 
Yeah, with that uh, information and taking good wishes of all of you, I invite Dr. Miraj Singh, uh, the, the um, program manager for National Biopharma Mission. National Biopharma Mission has been a huge catalyst in last, last three years. Uh, it's an offshoot of Bayrak, which has, uh, which has uh, kept the flag of MedTech high in India for over a decade now. And National Biopharma Mission has done incremental progress and provided um, substantial support to large number of projects in the country, including that were executed during COVID. So thanking Madam Secretary, I invite Dr. Miraj Singh uh, for his plenary talk. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sharma. Very good afternoon to all the panelists and all the participants who are watching this session. I have a speaker. <laughs> A little louder, a little louder, if you may please. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you, Doctor. I hope my screen is visible to all. So uh, a very informative introduction by Dr. Sharma and a very important update by Madam Secretary Pharmaceuticals. Uh, in continuation to that, my focus, uh, the focus of my talk will be on the interventions by National Biopharma Mission on the growth of biologicals in the country as well as medical devices and diagnostics. What interventions have uh, National Biopharma Mission done to support the overall growth of biologics and medical device and diagnostics in the country in terms of strengthening the facilities as well as developing the product portfolio in the country. So uh, India has been a leader in small molecule generics and is a worldwide leader both in terms of volume and the value. And uh, biologicals have emerged during the last two decades as one of the Key, uh, one of the very important component of the pharmaceutical industry. In spite of the inherent challenges associated with biologicals because of their inherent complexities, uh, complexities in the manufacturing, complexities in characterizing, complexities in storage, uh, there has been a very rapid and commendable growth in the sector of biologicals. And the main reason for that the potentials the biologicals carry to address the unmet medical need, the specificity which they possess. As a result of that, biologicals today have captured about 40% of the pharmaceutical market by value. And there is not a single disease area where biologicals have not registered their presence, especially in immunosuppressants, autoimmune disorders, oncology. of therapy are biologicals now. Talking about the Indian perspective, uh, since the launch of the first biosimilar, India is one of the first country which has launched the biosimilars in the country way back in early 2000. And since then, India has made progress uh, both, in the, both in terms of the number of biologicals released. Today, we have more than 100 biosimilars approved in the market, uh, excluding vaccines. But the main point, the discussion point is that the overall contribution of uh, Indian uh, partnership in global economy is, is still 5% by volume, by value. So we have to see that what government of India and what policies we need to adapt to take Indian biologicals and next generation biologicals into the global market so that this share can be increased. We have huge biomanufacturing capabilities which of course can be expanded but what is required is more innovations, uh, a step towards new biological entities, which can help recognize India, not only a hub for biomanufacturing, but as a hub of innovation. In this slide, we're talking about the major challenges faced by a product developer, a startup company, unlike IT, uh, biosimilar, so biological industry is, requires huge investment and this is because of the complex nature of these molecules. You need specialized facilities at every stage of the product development. 
there is a lengthy gestation time for the product development. This all adds up to the cost, which ultimately results in high cost to patients. And definitely, as I said, that there is a lack of novel biologicals in the country. However, we have more than 100 biosimilars, but novel biologicals are still very, very limited in the country. So, an initiative from both academia and industrial R&D is required at the earliest to support this R&D venture so that we can have more number of NBEs in coming one or two decades which can recognize India as a global leader of innovation. So, what uh, interventions NBM or the Government of India has done? To support the growth of biologicals and medical devices in the country, the mission was started in 2017. It's a joint venture of DBT and World Bank. And the main objective of this is to enable and nurture an ecosystem for preparing India's technological and product development capabilities in biopharmaceutical. We are mainly working on three components, vaccines, biotherapeutics, and medical device and diagnostics. And under each sector, we have identified the key gaps that what sort of shared facilities needs to be created which can uh, uh, promote the growth of this product development in the country and what sort of facilities are required to be created, what sort of existing facilities need to be strengthened and what sort of product portfolio needs to be supported for development. Talking about the bio facilities, after a very extensive landscaping and gap analysis in the country, what we realized that starting from the very beginning, what we lack is a uh, very well characterized cell line depository. There is a huge import load still for the parent cell lines uh, whenever one is going to start the development of biologicals. They have to import the parent cell lines that adds to import burden as well as the investment of the de uh, product development is increased manifold. So, well characterized cell lines available in the country where clone development can take place with those cell lines as well as the storage and characterization of the cell banks can happen in the country. So, a, few, a couple of facilities have been identified. Uh, these are the government facilities which have been uh, augmented to the level of international standards as well as going to the next stage of product development whether you are from academia or you are from startup or SMEs, you need access to a facility where you can scale up your technology and can, can manufacture clinical trial material under CGMP conditions. An integrated approach towards the process development and CGMP facilities have been adopted and now the NBM has supported uh, three facilities on shared basis where startups and SMEs can get access and they can have their products well characterized, can take it to the next step. Similarly, uh, the country, we realize that country lacks the enough number of GLP compliant characterization facilities because biologicals are inherently complex molecules. So you need to have a very, uh, very, very uh, comprehensive characterization of these molecules with the state of the art instrumentation. We have established these facilities in private as well as public sector. In the vaccine space also, the specialized facility needed for immunogenicity studies of the vaccines. The facilities at Asia Pune and uh, uh, Kim's Bangalore have contributed significantly towards the development of COVID-19 vaccines also. NBM has always a uh, vision for uh, supporting the technological platforms the next generation biopharmaceuticals and gene therapy and cell therapy are one of the areas which are upcoming areas in bio biologicals development. The facilities uh, required for the development of CAR T therapy, especially the viral vector uh, manufacturing facilities and the CGMP facilities for T cell transduction and expansion are also supported under these facilities. So, Product developers who are looking to develop products in this particular niche areas, they have accessible facilities available in the country. When we talking about the product development, without having a very comprehensive clinical trial conducted in the country, the product development pipeline is not complete. And under the NBM, we have actually promoted the public and private partnership between the hospitals to establish a clinical trial network which can support the clinical trials in various dif different disease areas. And all these clinical trial facilities have genes, GCP compliance at the sites, and that would also support the development of CT protocols for the site. This slide just mentions the overall ecosystem strengthening. 
not only vaccines and biosimilars, but for medical device also, as Dr. Sharma mentioned, that prototyping facilities of different natures, EMI, EMC facilities, large animal testing facilities have also been supported in the NBM. Clinical trial networks, we have now five hospital-based CT networks and 11 field sites contributing towards COVID-19 vaccine developments and other disease areas. One other important area which we have identified, which adds to the cost burden and adds to the cost of development of biosimilars is that we need to focus more on indigenous raw materials, the raw materials which are manufactured in the country, as well as scientific instrumentation towards this. Uh, we have supported some projects which are doing early phase development still, but they are expected to go beyond that and enter the market soon. Uh, raw materials which are required in biomanufacturing such as media, the resins required for protein purification, large scale purification, and bioreactors, single use bioreactors which are so far not available in the country, not manufactured by indigenous manufacturers. So initiatives towards the indigenization of these key technologies have also been taken in the National Bioformation. Skill development is very, very important aspect of any area and we are developing and we are actually training people in different, different areas of biosimilars and medical device di uh, diagnostics, be it technology transfers, regulatory requirements, or the different technological uh, domains of this of, of these areas, uh, be it upstream, downstream, or analytical characterization. So far, we have trained more than 1,300 people in different, different areas. We are also supporting technical technology transfer offices. Technologies developed and to be transferred to industries are supported with, uh, by these technology transfer offices. This slide reflects the different stages of product development and what stages we have supported the product development. As you can see from very early phase of the development till the late clinical phases, we have uh, provided the grant support to the product developers. We have also uh, done interventions for the development of raw materials. And this is the overall uh, product portfolio supported under NBM uh, with product descriptions. You can see that we have more than 12 products in very advanced stage of development and we hope that once they make market entry, they will create enough necessary competition, price competitions, and there will be affordable and accessible drugs available to the patients. The cost of care would reduce in, in different, different disease areas. So after talking about all these interventions, we have uh, tried to strengthen the facilities, supported grant giving grant support to the product developers. Uh, but there is still more to be done despite a significant progress in the last two years, the cost of care to patients, especially in biologicals and oncology sector, is still very high. Uh, this counts in several lakh rupees per patient. And as I said, that the cost of development of the product is high, so the cost of patient is still high. Can uh, government interventions step in and uh, we can think of some affordable and comprehensive insurance scheme, just like on the uh, on the lines of US and uh, European unions? But because as an example, what we can learn from them that a single biological molecule is making more economy than combined together all the biosimilars launched in India. A single pembrolizumab bread molecule has done a business of twenty billion dollars last year. So. These are some learnings and uh, how we can implement that kind of system, that kind of healthcare system in India that can not only provide affordable and, uh, and quality uh, health services, health uh, care to the patient, but uh, can also make it affordable. Also, uh, as an intervention, academy and industrial R&D need to be more focused on next generation novel biological gene and cell therapy, as we have seen during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that Development of the vaccine on novel platforms happened on such a fast track that, uh, I mean, a lot of companies in Europe, they are working on nucleic acid platforms, which was still, I mean, completely unknown in India. There's a requirement that these novel platforms, these novel technologies, novel biological entities are adapted very quickly so that we can have these products coming out, rolling out in the next few years. Also. In order to mitigate the cost of product development, there is a need of focus on the indigenization of raw material, especially scientific instrumentation. 
there is a huge burden on scientific instrumentation as dr sharma mentioned that like for medical devices there was a huge import load of medical devices but we have reduced that significantly similarly for scientific instrumentation very few scientific instruments used in biosimilar manufacturing are being manufactured in india so this is one key area where uh, grant support support to the starts up and smes to develop the scientific instrumentation can can give us good fruits in coming years uh, with this i would like to talk over to you dr sharma thank you very much thank you very much dr miraj you can stop sharing your screen but thank you for giving us a flair of nbm as it is popularly called the national biopharma mission uh, which is uh, absolutely a mission that works on mission mode approach i have had uh, several personal experiences of excellent coordination and and high speed decision making from nbm always uh, i will uh, now go to my esteemed panel um starting with mr sashi kumar mr sashi uh, once upon a time a bright young engineer gold medalist from one of india's premier institutions iit madras uh, that's the best combination we can have and you ended up choosing medical technology when the word medtech didn't exist and you have nurtured it for decades to be one of the most prestigious a neonatal and maternal care uh, equipment suppliers globally for the young startups that are also in this session besides large number of manufacturers and 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 r&d partners uh, if i may request others to mute the mic uh, uh, mr sashi the key points uh, on which you may like to uh, share your wisdom uh, particularly to uh, to give to share your knowledge with the budding companies and entrepreneurs that we have on this session and elsewhere is startups fail in evidence generation a wrong pathway for clinical trial in an unknown subject can actually lead to product delays indian innovations have to compete uh, with large number of innovations mini chip products coming in and indian startups need support of procurement and market access what are your thoughts on these three points and if there is another any other point that you would like to add you have 3 to 4 minutes we need to wind up this session at 4 so if i can request you to be short and specific as always uh thank you dr sharma and uh, the good afternoon to fellow fellow panelist uh yes i mean uh, one of the main things for any young startup is to try and generate evidence and if you look at it i mean i would even say most of the uh, uh, startups when they start off they always have a big picture in uh, in mind they have uh, you know the amount of demand as what uh, madam secretary was saying that the demand side is what the you know we can create i mean the sense uh, the country has already has and if you look at it any of these demand when you look at it the major demand is from the government and when you go to the government the first question they ask is what is the evidence now when you go to the evidence thing is this particular product whatever has been i mean if if it has to be consumed by the uh, government the evidence is very important where do you go for the evidence this is a very very crucial question so the clinical trial is a pretty very very important uh, proposition because initially as you bring the product most of the times the well wishers will like the product and they will buy it or the curiosity people the guys who are really curious about the product they will buy it that is not evidence generation you need to really put the product in the in, into the into the hospital work with the clinicians make sure many clinicians across country take it up and you know uh, create i mean you say that this product is useful it will you know essentially benefit the society so that's very very crucial and i i would say one of the things which you have done uh, dr sharma is to bring in the you know big animal lab this is very important because so so many products cannot be directly put on a patient and as what we seen even in a vaccine case where you want to you know ramp up and go into the market fast you cannot do it unless and until you do kind of you know getting the product into the uh, in, into a proper evidence building so he, having said that the next important point is how do we make sure this product is then consumed by the government definitely there is something called as health technology assessment 
we definitely need to understand that the, the any of the you know people in the government would like to know what is the kind of benefit the end patient uh, has and how it is affecting the economy these are very very important so these are things which has to be taken and brought forth to the government or to the policy makers or to the buying uh, governments and so on this is pretty important of course there is a portal today gem through which you can uh, do uh, your uh, selling your products there are so many ways in which it can be i mean there are so many new innovative ways which the government has allowed new startups to get in so this is one another thing which uh, i would definitely say is a useful way of getting into the market uh, with this i hand it back to dr sharma thank you mr sashi thank you for for very precise comments um, i go to our uh, master blaster mr rajiv nath uh, for the next uh, <laughs> for the next round of batting uh mr nath uh, we hear a lot of policy inputs and uh, uh, technicalities from you particularly with respect to medtech business but you are yourself a very successful entrepreneur and uh, run a very successful enterprise what advice do you have for entrepreneurs to set up distribution networks that are internationally competitive that are uh, that can intersect the markets where indian made products needs to go and do you have any advice on licensing pathways that uh, uh, th that the government can introduce to enable young entrepreneurs uh, cut short the time which usually takes years over to you mr nath thank you dr sharma and incidentally it will be interesting for the viewers and the panelists to know that uh, Mr. Sashi Kumar who just spoke was the person who introduced me to Dr. Sharma many years, a decade back in WHO Geneva meeting. Uh, coming back to the topic over here, uh, I'll quickly touch uh, the policy part where we feel that uh, what's the topic on discussion over here, uh, where the government can by policy support the entrepreneurs. So first issue is regarding the issue about uh, promoting Indian innovation. So India has got a Design India certification scheme. This is on the lines of the Red Dot internationally or the uh, Japan's uh, good design part. This is available for everything whether it's a scooter or a furniture or a medical device. And entrepreneurs should be seeking that. And when they do get it, we would request that the government should be having a preferential pricing of giving, say, for example, a 3% price advantage available in common tenders available to such manufacturers who have got Design India certification uh, on what they've bid for. This will promote innovation, it will promote indigenization. The second area where we would feel that the policy makers can definitely help the entrepreneurs is in the area of creating templates of agreements. So when a manufacturer wants to sublicense a technology on an e-platform like Dr. Sharma was mentioning will be launched shortly or from a Birak uh, led institute, they are not aware as to what are the nitty gritties of a legal commercial agreement and they can't afford lawyers. It will be nice for them to have a template by which they can work on in terms of negotiating with a, uh, an academic institution or with a industry board, uh, body over there which will help them to conclude the agreements uh, rapidly. The third area is now coming back to the meat of the points which Dr. Sharma mentioned and did desired for me. So the most important part and the biggest stumbling block for any entrepreneur and a startup is how does he market the product that he's made. Now most people tend to think that what I'm making with my doctor friend or my engineer friend is something that is going to be a great success. Like Mr. Sachi mentioned, clinical evaluation and STAs are important to measure that thought was valid or not valid. Many times that you think it's a good idea, but the doctors or the market may not think it's a good idea. So that validation is very important. So once you have that in place, the second part is to have a marketing plan. What kind of organization and budget do you have for marketing? Can you do it by yourself or do you want to subcontract the whole marketing exercise 
by hatching, uh, uh, latching on to a larger organization pull to the marketing for you so you work as a back office as a subcontractor you have the design control you have the technology control you have got the complete product quality control but then you are giving the product to somebody who may market the product for you somebody like transasia or somebody like hmd or somebody like tripitron for example that comes to the marketing part so again marketing agreement templates will be branding will be a weaker brand if it's a consumer product then the branding will be a stronger brand then the marketing plan and the marketing expense also will change because then you have to promote that with the help of publicity and then by advertisement now people think you need a lot of money for advertisement but good products normally need basically publicity to enter the market you do get advertisements to sustain what you got success in the market so advertisement comes later on you don't need to burn the money straight away the other area is very critical is in pricing most entrepreneurs in their zeal to succeed in the market and trying to be competitive they say something is coming that imported or mine is a better design which got four and so on so on clinical advantages i've proven by a clinical evaluation study i've proven by an fta mine is a definitely superior product but by my cost i can make it at one third the price if something is coming at ten thousand dollars i can give it at three thousand dollars in india and you jump it the market and you start promoting it straight away to the hospitals at three thousand dollars now the buyer needs credit do you have the money for the credit is that built into the pricing tomorrow you are not able to service every hospital directly so you need to have a distributor to uh, market the product and for the various parts of the country so somebody has to stock the product for you and then give it to the hospital and provide the credit so have you provided for that discount in that pricing facility or not if you've not provided a discounting in, in that it will be very difficult for you to rearrange the pricing so distribution discounting again is very important distribution again whether you want to have a master distributor for the whole country a distributor for a zone a distributor for the region a distributor for a city or you want to have a dealer network or an open network where any the dealer can buy from the distributor or any dealer can buy from you so depending upon the product or the market outreach you have to decide your distribution policy and the discount policy alongside the next part along comes franchising and it also comes regarding licensing over here so you may want to sometimes just focus on the technological part and then let somebody like transasia or somebody like hmd or tribitron do the complete manufacturing and then go for the marketing then you just have to get a 3% or 5% royalty and that will keep you sustained so there are various models and business models which you can go for one should thank not miss everything thank you thank you thank you mr nath and uh, i realize that the just like we take so many of your inputs and suggestion in policy making we must also tap into your wisdom uh, for the benefit of our budding businesses and enterprises very useful my next guest is mr madan krishnan uh, vice president metronic a thought leader in medtech in india and the question to you uh, mr madan and the point we would like to hear from you is that health technology assessment while it exists in india and uh, since 2012 when we started it for the first time it has not got integrated into uh, approvals of medical devices particularly in health programs where do you see and, and this is not the case in 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 the in the countries that have shown great advances in medtech what do you what do you foresee as a pathway to integrate hta into hd health technology assessment into health technology uh, please share your share your thoughts yep thank you thank you dr sharma pleasure to be here so i think the most important thing as far as i look at the medical technology industry is that even compared to pharma it's a is an industry which is more curative in nature than palliative in a big way and the biggest advantage as i see is it's an accelerator to the economy not there is the jobs not just the financial contribution of taxes and all it's the greatest accelerator to an economy that to like india there's a recent study of a couple years not very recent two years ago harvard medical school study which shows that the morbidity and the loss of manpower uh, due to illness non communicable diseases can cause trillions of dollars of damage possibly about 4 trillions of damage over the next two decades 
So there is a very clear case in point on how do we articulate the outcome. So Dr. Sharma and colleagues, I think the objective is that how do we move from that you know episode of care to a continuum of care? And there I can see uh, evidence is the number one objective there. Starting with the clinical evidence, correct? Whether how the clinical trials are monitored and mentored and reported out. We have a unique role to play in India, even just in the clinical trial area. If you look at adverse event reporting in India, that's another area we should open our eyes. Very few adverse events are reported. Doesn't mean that there are no adverse events. But I think we need to get into a culture of reporting adverse events because from those adverse events we learn the fact that we are diligent in our quality assessments. But to your question on health technology assessment, multiple healthcare systems have provided faster access, differentiated reimbursement for advanced outcome based models. I can give a couple of examples. In the US, Medtronic, we do a guarantee program to hospitals to say that if a patient who goes to a spinal surgery gets an infection or an adverse event after that, we reimburse possibly a 10x or 8x or 10x of the amount to the to the hospital system. I can tell you first, we've also recently done a product in India where we are saying that if an infection happens when you implant a pacemaker, we will give a compensation to the hospital and the patients and the charges of a revision surgery will be taken by the company. So such models are possible and we need to see more such models. Now the question is, how do you institutionalize them? And how do you ensure that there is a transparent recognition of the value add? And I think that is where the HCA assessment comes into play. What we need to celebrate is the clinical research part of it. That what are the endpoints? Are there primary endpoints or secondary endpoints being met here? And we can certainly lead the way because other than a few Western countries, not everyone is capable enough in this area. And this would be in addition to R&D, this would be a unique area for us to add value. I would also talk about digital here. Digital is another leveler, great leveler, where artificial intelligence and digital also allow us to give early indicators to even avoid a negative situation. To give an example, uh, alert in a, in, a, in a diabetes pump uh, transmitted through an iPhone can tell the mother that the child who is in school with diabetes is going to have an hypo event within an hour, in an hour. So mother can instruct the teacher to give some carbohydrate or some treatment, support food to the child. Similarly, artificial intelligence recently introduced is allowing doctors to diagnose the, the nature of a stroke, ischemic stroke within two minutes rather than two hours. So these value added products and approaches will need a differentiated and a better recognition in price and reimbursement. And I would say that that is what will add a significant value to healthcare system. And this is an area, Dr. Sharma, you're absolutely right. This is an area where we can quickly go over other countries without too much of capital intensive nature. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Madan. Uh, uh, I know you are a great advocate of HTA. All I wanted to uh, jointly bring to the notice of our viewers is HTA can be one of the big triggers of medtech revolution in India. Thank you. Uh, my next guest, Dr. Naveen Nishal, healthcare practitioner, a uh, person, uh, person who madly runs hospitals and healthcare programs. Uh, the, the question to you is, see when we buy a CT scan or an MRI in a hospital, we have the choice of buying a 32 slice CT scan or a 128 slice CT scan. We have a choice of buying 0.3 Tesla MRI or 1.5 Tesla MRI. And these decisions have huge economic impact to the industry. In Ayushman Bharat, and keeping in mind the quality and safety of care, how do we make technology choices? What should be the key drivers? And uh, while I request Mr. Naveen to respond, I'll request other guests to mute them. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharma. Thank you very much for having me here. I think it's been more than two years now so far. So many patients treated, so many lives saved uh, with Ayushman Bharat and undoubtedly this scheme has been the biggest savior and created a huge impact. I will tell you uh, with my experience, I mean, while, while I was running my hospitals in tier two and tier three cities, 
how I made my decisions of buying machines. During my uh, Cygnus journey, I, I, I you know, uh, thought of running hospitals in tier two and tier three cities. And the idea was that these are the places where uh, we don't have tertiary care or high secondary uh, care services available. So while buying CT scan or while buying, you know, ultrasound machine, uh, because we uh, we believe in a you know asset light model or we we don't spend much on equipment and at the same time we we want to take care of quality also during my journey of tier 2 uh, working in tier 2 and tier 3 cities when i ha i had to buy a ct scan i knew that in in this hospital i am not going to you know cater to high end patient like you know oncology patient or some high end you know surgery patients so my idea was to take care of neurosurgery patients for neurosurgery patients you don't need you know high end uh, ct scan you know you, you don't need you know 500 slice or 125 slice ct so i i started with four slices ct in these areas and while it comes to you know ultrasound machines i used to buy gold standard refurbished machine because i wanted to treat patients during golden hour period my aim was not to you know do high end things i wanted to save lives in emergency so with that idea i set up all my hospitals so that is how i uh, you know uh, chose all this equipment uh, during my journey but when it comes to you know diagnostic setup i used to set up the best of the diagnostics uh, mr vajirani is here suresh vajirani is here so in all my labs i used to buy transitia equipment so one question so i have one yeah. question i have the national yeah. accreditation board of hospitals nabh yeah. which takes care of quality of care in hospitals yeah. yeah how do we integrate the medtech advances in nabh quality of care if you can throw some light yeah so i think why why uh, you know in india we although nabh is a quality benchmark but there are a lot of hospitals which are which are not nabh accredited but they are uh, you know uh, providing good quality services i mean in when you are setting up a, a lab or a diagnostic or a you know therapeutic facility you you go to you know all these companies and get best of the equipment and when whenever nabh team visits your hospital so whenever they see you know better equipment they they immediately you know they uh, give you a kind of an accreditation if Thank you. from ampz if from ampz and if you can you know talk to nabh guy that whatever indigenous equipment we are making so they are at par so whenever you are visiting the facilities you can you know take all these things in account Thank you so yes. much. Uh, thank you so much for giving the thought that actually indigenous medical equipment can be part of some scoring criteria in indigenous yeah. healthcare quality scores. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my next uh, guest and panelist, Dr. Manoj Madhavan, Managing Director, Boston Scientific. Uh, personally, uh, Dr. Manoj is known for being a patient safety ambassador, and his team is also known for known for bringing patient safety. Uh, 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 specific solutions. Dr. Manoj, the emerging medtech also comes with huge range of potential risks and challenges, right from undiagnosed tumors to excessive blood loss. Uh, from a patient safety perspective, uh, what should the emerging medtech keep in mind? Uh, what should they not forget so that while creating new technologies, we don't create new risks? Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jitendra Sharma, for you know setting the stage and a very uh, you know good afternoon, evening to all my distinguished uh, fellow panelists. Uh, a very interesting discussion uh, you know so far, and uh, I think in the interest of time, I will probably go straight uh, you know to the point which which you had asked. So it's all about collecting clinical data, health tech assessment over a period of time. I think overtly, uh, you know, when you're looking at affordability and when you're looking at uh, you know the complex challenges which we face in India. I think it boils down sometimes to just the cost of the medical device, but unfortunately, that is doesn't risk, result in an optimal care, right? 
and not only that i think madan uh, uh, touched upon it in terms of adverse reactions or follow up of patients right so are we following the patient to the care of continuum somebody who has been uh, you know diagnosed with afib which can be resulting in a potential stroke you know has decades of year ahead of you know him or her so, and and sometimes the intention is you know what let's look at just giving the person blood thinners which will cost maybe thousands of rupees a month but you're talking about decades of survival and 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 on the contrary you can potentially go for a treatment you know which will cost you lakhs of rupees and the minute you look at thousands of you know uh, rupees of medicines versus a lakh of rupee of uh, implant you know something uh, like a watchman device which boston scientific manufacturers you're completely taking the patient off blood thinners for the rest of their lives right and then you're talking about a very different patient outcome and if you're looking at the overall cost of care it substantially comes down so i think hta is something which needs to grow and dr jitender you said that uh, pharma took three decades to get where we are we are just 5 6 years into focusing on medtech it is not about manufacturing devices or you know kind of copying innovations at a cheap, cheaper cost it is about evidence on patient safety and i think whatever policies you know we make uh, you know uh, for india to incentivize uh, uh, home grown innovations where the investment comes from multinationals or domestic companies i think every policy needs to have a line on patient safety and optimal patient outcome and when you're talking about aishwan bharat and schemes like that which is so ambitious just the sheer scale is so mind boggling how can we imbibe these learnings into that rather than looking at just a fee for service i i think those are a couple of uh, points i would like to leave it in the interest of time and hand it back to you thank you mr madhavan thank you so much uh the most experienced bowler gets the last over uh, our esteemed panelist dr suresh wazirani uh namaste uh generally globally it is diagnostics which is first then comes the doctor then comes the drug which is prescription but in our case we first run to the chemist shop we take the drug if it doesn't work we go to the doctor and if the doctor doesn't understand what's happening we go to the diagnostics we follow the entire healthcare in a reverse chain how do you correct it and what is the role of diagnostics in providing uh, evidence based healthcare and, and 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 streamlining this reverse value chain that we always follow mr suresh thank you thank you dr sharma i believe that the real role of diagnostic is really in prevention and i believe a developing country like india should really be focusing on prevention rather than just a cure you know even though we all hear that prevention is better than cure but we, when we get to our offices we forget that um, so i believe that this is where how do we convince the government that every penny spent on prevention is worth at least 100 pennies you would save on cure so this is where the real utility of diagnostic can be if you can find some way that every indian will get tested once a year or once in two years that will have a transformational effect on our healthcare uh, because right now we are treating only the you know serious cases because we don't do anything before that even in diagnostics uh, more than 70% of our indian population have not had a blood test now that is something we should reflect on that in, a, in today's age 70% of our fellow indians have not had any any test so this shows that we have a long way to go and that prevention is really where we should focus on and i wish the government will allocate, allocate a significant part of the annual budget on prevention thank you thank you mr wazirani one additional sub question a last one from me for now is that rt pcr we could shine out as a country in one year why haven't we touched things like electrolyte analyzer which is required for critical care right in emergency room technologically or from a policy perspective what is the barrier that prevents our manufacturers to get on with complex technologies in diagnostics well as we all know not only in diagnostics in overall healthcare cost is a big deterrent uh, you know a person who is earning 200 300 rupees a day 
Uh, how do you expect him to go and do one electrolyte test that costs 300 rupees? So the odds are so against the, but somehow we have developed a high cost healthcare system, which of course is 70, 80% dependent on the imports. So the, while there's a reason for it, but there's no justification why we cannot have a more affordable healthcare. If, if a patient can do a electrolyte in 30 rupees, I'm sure that everybody can benefit from it. So it comes down to the affordability and affordability comes down to Atmanirbha Bharat. These two are connected issues. So it's not just a question of, it's not an option for India to have Atmanirbha or not. I think it is a real necessity. And until we do that, we can never provide proper health care to our 130 crore people. Thank you for connecting uh, service delivery to industrial promotion. And I think you repeated what Madam Secretary also mentioned in the beginning, the inevitability of medtech of right. rising to the occasion. Uh, thank you. If Madam Secretary is there, I will request her for one closing remark. Uh, if she is uh, occupied in other meetings, I will request Dr. Arti from Bairak to propose a vote of thanks. I am very much here. I am honored. <laughs> <laughs> Very much here. Uh, Ma'am, couple of closing remarks from you. Before yeah, yeah, because I was listening to the, yes, I, I may like to say that, uh, first of all, uh, I got to hear some of the new ideas this time, uh, especially regarding, and I must say that, uh, Dr. Sharma, your uh, uh, segues from one uh, speaker to the other were also very, very uh, interesting apart from the cricketing analogy i like the sequencing that you talked about just now diagnostic doctor and drugs and uh, i believe we got some good inputs here from uh, both the biopharma mission which you have seen is uh, going about uh, uh, the business of providing found foundational strength to the pharmaceuticals industry in a very systematic manner what you would have noticed there was the large number of uh, uh, institutes of repute available in the public sector also in India, which are being roped in for this. I believe there will be a lot of uh, benefit to be reaped by stronger industry academia or industry research organization linkage in the day to come. So when you talked about the vision in the beginning, Dr. Sharma, I would make a plea for this august uh, audience that we need to have a very systematic approach to industry academia linkage it cannot be transactional or ad hoc the second very um, uh, useful uh, input that i got from this uh, discussion here today is regarding the way startups or entrepreneurs look at problems and where they come from i mean i think uh, uh, dr namin also spoke about this and here I feel there is again an opportunity for the young talent in our country and also to attract back talent into India if we are able to have a program with the help of industry as well as research organizations for developing uh, entrepreneurs, what we call entrepreneur development programs which include an incubation uh, lab, uh, a kind of entrepreneurship uh, support or hand-holding program housed in research uh, institutions and from our side we can offer NIPER as a, as a, as a you know, location where such uh, entrepreneurship development can also be attempted which will again coming back to my earlier uh, point bring in frugal innovation to solve the problems that confront the healthcare industry. So uh, I do think that we uh, there was a lot of value add, a lot of uh, navinata, newness in the issues that came up today for discussion. So I thank all the panelists for that. And I thank uh, Dr. Sharma, of course, for his uh, wonderful uh, guidance to the entire discussion. Thank you very much. Sir. We are once again honored to hear you. And we look forward to uh, another opportunity to uh, hearing uh, from you soon again. Um, Dr. Arti, I hand over the mic to you for proposing a vote of thanks to our very esteemed panelists. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, with this, we come to the end of the session. 
And on behalf of DBT and Barak, I extend a very hearty vote of thanks to all the speakers of the session for this uh, very fruitful discussion. Uh, my sincere thanks to Madam Secretary uh, for providing insightful inputs. Ma'am, we are all inspired by your great words. I wish to express my gratitude to our expert panelists for sharing with us uh, your valuable opinion and showing us the way forward. I would also like to thank Dr. Sharma for moderating the session. Uh, thank you all for being with us uh, this uh, evening. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.